Uh, we've got one microphone here at the thing, but we decided just to leave it here, and I hope you can all hear me. It's a much smaller room than uh, in the end. You might have noticed there's quite a few events on at the moment. Now, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Joseph. I'm the director of the Gaston Centre, and we're very pleased to uh, present tonight's event along with Human Rights Watch. But, um, remiss of me, I would um, like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Kulin, uh, peoples of the Kulin Nations, on whose land we're gathered here today to pay my respects to Elders Park and Park. Um, so, today's, uh, tonight's event is on um, human rights in Uganda, entitled Intimidation and Repression in Uganda. As has become custom, the Catholic Centre will be tweeting this event, and if you are interested in following along, the hashtag is hashtag CCUganda. So I should uh, inform both of our speakers, people aren't just sitting there texting, they're tweeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, uh, we have two excellent speakers tonight. I'll introduce them in turn. So our first speaker is Maria Burnett, who is Senior Researcher in the Africa Division of Human Rights Watch, and she currently covers uh, Uganda, emerging, um, emerging human rights issues in Central Africa, and she supervises work on Somalia and Kenya. Uh, she has worked with Human Rights Watch since 2005, first as the Burundi researcher in the Bujumbura uh, Field Office, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Sorry, Bujumbura. Uh, and Maria has also uh, worked on a range of human rights issues, including child soldiers, torture and killings by intelligence and counter-terrorism counter agents, abuses by the Lord's Resistance Army, and justice reform in Central and East Africa. Will you please welcome Maria Dunn. Maybe just to explain, I think as Nicholas and I envisioned things, I was going to talk a bit about the, the run-up to this uh, most recent set of elections. You're going to just had elections in February, and Nicholas was going to talk a bit about the aftermath of those elections. It's been quite an uh, exciting uh, few months in Uganda. Um, but obviously we're happy to take questions on a whole range of issues, and I'll mention uh, on the Human Rights Watch side of things, in my time covering Uganda as Human Rights Watch, I've worked on a really broad range of topics. Um, everything from sort of business and human rights, security sector reform, criminal justice, uh, juveniles, uh, just a, a really broad range. So I'm happy to talk about any of that if there's particular interest in the room. Um, so as I'm sure many of you know, uh, President Museveni has been in power now since 1986. Uh, in 2005, the Constitution was amended to eliminate term limits, which uh, paved the way for him to be able to run uh, several more times, and he has just won the most recent elections in February of this year. Uh, in the run-up to those elections, we had many of the concerns that we have had over the last decade, I would say, in Uganda. So we've put out reports, for example, looking at threats to civil society operating space. It's quite a, a complicated issue, and it's one that affects many different countries in East Africa. Um, in the Uganda context, we've been particularly concerned about uh, NGOs that are working on issues that touch on the finances. So particularly, for example, groups looking at land, evictions, um, oil sector transparency, and money transparency in the way government operates. And then in terms of uh, human rights organizations, we've had a lot of concerns about the government's treatment of LGBTI Ugandans and uh, groups that are working to protect the rights of LGBTI people in Uganda. Um, over the years, as we've documented different threats to civil society operating space, I feel like what we've seen is the government more or less harden its position, um, that, uh, and, and we've just seen them write and pass a new law, I hope Nicholas will talk about it more, but the troubling aspect of that was that in the midst of the run-up to these elections, the government presented a law which basically created a series of new crimes for NGO workers, uh, including making a punishable three-year offense for, the viol for violating the rights and, vi sorry, violating the dignity of um, the people of Uganda, which we felt was, you know, obviously a really broad and vague term that left the interpretation of the dignity of all Ugandans just open to the government alone, and therefore anything that the government deemed to be a problem could potentially be captured in that phrase. Um, We've had long-standing concerns about media freedom and freedom of expression in Uganda, particularly for rural-based journalists. There's a real, I think we see a, a real dichotomy almost in Uganda in the print speaking, uh, sorry, in the print English-speaking media, the newspapers that publish in Kampala. You can certainly criticize government. 
you can uh, point out problems in governance. But when you get into the more rural areas and you get into local languages, um, there we see, I think, a, a different landscape. Uh, the journalists are much more vulnerable to intimidation and threats. There's a quite heavy presence of the ruling party and the intelligence services are, are quite dominant. And uh, it's always important to note that most radio stations in Uganda are owned either by the government or by ruling party parliamentarians, which means they obviously have a vested business interest in ensuring that, uh, generally speaking, the, the discussions on radio support the government line. So over the years, we've documented various kinds of threats. Um, for example, in the run-up to the 2011 elections, we had concerns such as you know, you try to host a talk show on a, on a radio station, this is up country, you invite uh, different representatives of the different political groups, the ruling party chooses not to send someone, it leaves the ruling, it leaves the program manager in a real bind, because if they host the program, they fear that intelligence will come and shut down the program, and we had many instances of that. We had similar concerns in the run-up to these elections, where some of the stations that hosted opposition political parties or representatives uh, were temporarily pulled off air. Um, so these kinds of threats and intimidation to free expression have played a really troubling role. At the same time, I think we've seen a, a real change when it comes to social media. It certainly allowed um, different people to participate and express themselves and to expand the space for free expression. And in turn, we saw the government try to shut down social media during the election. They tried to, to ban all access to, to social media during the past election for five days didn't really work. People wildly downloaded VPNs and, and went around the blockades that had been put up. Um, but it was an interesting example of efforts to constrain the space for free expression in Uganda. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll mention as far as our concerns, long-standing concerns about the, the conduct of security forces, particularly in the space for public assemblies. Um, we've, we've had a uh, several instances where there have been uh, anti-government demonstrations over the last uh, seven, eight years, and each time there have been killings of either protesters or largely bystanders to protest. So we saw the military and the police be deployed very, very quickly, and then uh, immediately the use of live uh, gunfire in situations where there was no lethal threat posed to the security forces and we are constantly reminding the security forces that they have to operate within the UN principles which means that they can only use lethal force when it uh, is required to protect human life um, and for many years now we've been pushing the government to hold investigations into the killings that occurred in 2009 and in 2011 it's actually the five-year anniversary of a bunch of killings that happened in April 2011, uh, just this week. In fact, uh, tomorrow is the anniversary of the killing of a two-year-old child in Masaka that occurred during anti-government uh, demonstrations. Uh, and still there's been no investigation and no one's been held accountable for her death. Um, in the face of the criticism that Human Rights Watch and other NGOs brought to the table about the conduct of security forces during assemblies, um, what we've seen is the government become one of the uh, largest consumers of tear gas in uh, all of Africa. So they've really, really escalated the, the desire to have non-lethal means. Now that's certainly uh, a good thing in the sense that we hope that that would be they would reduce their use of live gunfire. But we've also had a lot of concerns about the way tear gas has been used and the context in which it's been used. For example, in September of last year, we documented many different instances in which tear gas was used basically to just keep people away from hearing the views of the opposition. So it was used before anybody had demonstrated or done anything. It was an opposition meeting, and the police argued that because the meeting was in and of itself done without police um, permission, that that was a basis to tear gas the attendees who were there. They ended up tear gassing school children. They lobbed these canisters into, into some primary schools. We also documented uh, instances in which the tear gas was used as a weapon that is fired directly at journalists to stop them from being able to record or broadcast live events as they were unfolding. Um, you know, advocacy with the government in Uganda is very challenging. As I said, they've been in power for a very long time. I think President Museveni's sort of inner circle of advisors is, is um, decreasing over the years. Um, we do meet with the government very, very regularly, but it is a challenge when it's the same people in power for so many years. I think that um, what I've seen is an amazing capacity of the government of Uganda to exhaust 
um, the diplomatic community and even some NGOs in their dialogue. Uh, and I think it can be quite frustrating that even when there are advocacy wins, for example, uh, Nicholas can talk about this as well, but finally after many years Uganda passed a law criminalizing torture, it would seem like a basic thing, but for many years there was no law in the books that criminalized torture, and we had many, many, many cases of torture going on in the country. But despite that law being passed, we still haven't seen a single prosecution take place because police and prosecutors don't work together to actually bring those, courts, those cases before courts of law. So, uh, you know, I would say over my time of working on Uganda, we have small successes as far as fighting to protect human rights, but the big picture remains quite problematic. And certainly, it's uh, no secret that part of what makes advocacy to protect human rights in Uganda difficult is because the government of Uganda is a really important ally to some Western governments in the fight against terrorism in East Africa. I'm sure as many of you know, the Ugandans are the sort of lead boots on the ground in the African Union's mission in Somalia. Um, you know, many of us would argue that Uganda has its own reasons for being there, that it has its own concerns for the presence of al-Shabaab in East Africa, but I think there is a concern, certainly in the United States, that the Ugandans are sort of some extent seen as a proxy Western force, and so therefore um, they have not always wanted to scrutinize the actions of the security forces domestically. Um, there's also a, a pretty significant and interesting operation going against the Lord's Resistance Army, as I'm sure many of you know there has been a long conflict between the Lord's Resistance Army and the Museveni government in northern Uganda. Uh, over the years it's been deep displaced to Congo and now to Central African Republic. Um, and a few years ago, President Obama signed a law uh, which said that the United States was going to give military advisors to assist in the fight against the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, there were a lot of theories about how that mission would come together. It was supposed to be a sort of regional task force under an AU umbrella. In reality, it's really come to mean that there is a deployment of Ugandan soldiers in Central African Republic. Meanwhile, Kony himself has moved into what is the jurisdiction of Sudan, which means it's actually beyond the reach of both the US military advisors and the Ugandan military. So it remains a very difficult operation. I think there's you know, all good reason to try to protect people in that region from the Lord Resistance Army, but there are also a lot of other uh, warring parties in that region. And uh, I'm very concerned that that mission is very, very expensive with um, not necessarily as much a proactive effort to improve the security vacuum in that region, which remains, the people there remain very, very vulnerable to attacks by all different groups. Um, so our push has certainly been to look at Uganda's key donors and to say, you need to be speaking truth here about the abuses that are going on the electoral season, and, and this is what I hope Nicholas will talk about, is some of the abuses that went on uh, after the election. But this is a precarious time, I think, as we look into the next five years with the government taking, taking uh, the, the new parliament taking office in June, I guess it will be. Um, where is this going to go? And how is the political opposition finding a space to be uh, you know, in opposition role? Can they bring issues to the table? Can parliament function as a check on the power of the executive? Can Uganda's strong constitution, there are many good human rights principles in Uganda's constitution, that unfortunately don't really end up uh, living a full life in, in, the, in the reality of the rights of Ugandans. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take questions, and I'm, I'm grateful for all the interest in Uganda this evening. Thank you. We will have uh, time for questions at the end, but it gives me a great pleasure to introduce our second speaker tonight, uh, Nicholas Hopkins who is a leading human rights lawyer from Uganda and a fine founder of the human rights organisation chapter for Uganda. And he has worked tirelessly since 2005 to defend civil liberties in Uganda, uh, often for free and often and on behalf of society's most vulnerable and marginalised. Nicholas has worked on a broad range of critical human rights issues in Uganda. And he was a key leader in drafting and advocating for Uganda's law of human rights and torture, which we just heard about. Um, he has successfully argued in many um, high-level constitutional challenges uh, 
um, including uh, one of the notorious anti-homosexuality act of 2013, which was in this country, which was declared null and void in August of 2014. Please welcome me.
during the election, there were serious concerns uh, that were raised. The first, really, as Uganda is going to the polls, uh, the president, or the government for that matter, switched off social media and mobile money platforms. Now, mobile money doesn't make sense to people in Australia, right? You have plastic cards. But in Uganda, the vast majority of the rural population depend on mobile money, mobile phones to send money to people. So if my father in the village uh, for half hours in North of Kampala is sick and wants money for, uh, you know, by medicine, he would simply call me and I would get on my phone and send him money and he would see a doctor. So mobile money is a very powerful means of transaction. So on the opening of ballots on the 18th of February, the mobile money platforms were switched off. That meant that the position leaders who were supposed to send money to their agents uh, who were supposed to go at the, you know, at the polling stations to preserve elections were unable to do so. As a result, many of the agents couldn't get money, um, so they had to leave, uh, you know, leave their stations to run the food and the process, you know, miss out on the chance to actually observe the elections in uh, uh, their local areas. In many cases, many of them just didn't turn up because they had money to have transport to the polling station. The second one was social media. Now, you have to understand the role social media plays in Uganda as a truth mobilization. I appreciate just how sad it was that social media was switched out. First of all, social media is the main form of activism, you know, activism now. During the election, so many candidates were able to reach so many people because of social media. Of course, social media was also used for other propaganda purposes, but on the whole, it was a very important tool for organization. So, a citizen who was seeing human rights violation could simply use his or her phone, take a picture, and tweet it, or send it by WhatsApp, send it on Facebook, and that would create real outrage across the country. So, what they did on the election day was to switch off social media, thereby denying people the chance uh, to report live what was happening denying uh, very many people a chance to even report results of the elections uh, as they were counted on polling stations. So this was deliberate. Even though many Ugandans found their way around it by downloading the VPN, I think they helped us to learn about the VPN. Many people uh, went online and downloaded the VPN, but even then that was still disruptive and wasn't enough to restore, to restore uh, uh, access. The second important thing that happened on election day was that one of the candidates was arrested. Now you imagine a candidate in the election was being arrested on polling day. And the reason was simple. He wasn't even demonstrating, he wasn't causing any problem. He suspected that a house in an upscale part of town was being used to stuff ballot papers. So he simply stormed the house and asked the house to open it with the And for doing that, he was arrested and driven back to his house in order to stay in his house. While the people who were stuffing ballots in that house were jumping over the fence, in full view of TV cameras, and throwing ballot boxes across the fence, uh, the position leader was being arrested and told to go back home and stay in there, and I'm not complaining about it. That marked the beginning of a house arrest for that position leader, uh, who was never allowed to leave his house for 45 days. For no reason, there was no charge in court. There was no case against him. But he just couldn't leave his house. He couldn't even see his lawyers to be able to challenge the election in court. Uh, he couldn't go to the party offices because even the party offices were raided because it was alleged that he was compiling his own results. Um, so even if the elections, these serious concerns in many uh, respects uh, really affect the culture of our election. The president might have won, he might have got a legal victory in the Supreme Court, but there's a whole question about the legitimacy of his election. Uh, and that will make the next five years a difficult time for the <coughs> The second thing really about the, 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 the uh, post election is the, the continued restriction. Even if after 45 days, the opposition leader is now allowed to leave his house, he leaves his house under police escorts, he's being followed wherever he goes. Uh, is unable to do anything without interference by the state. Uh, just yesterday, somebody was uh, informing me back home. He was going to attend to a court hearing west of the country. He was followed throughout uh, the country. 
and uh, as I speak now, he's being holed up in a hotel. He can't leave the hotel uh, in that district because they just blocked his, his, his way. No reason given. Now, each time he attempts to come back, he's a very popular guy, he's called Dr. Kizo. Each time he attempts to come to town, he attracts a large crowd, and people come to show support. The police got tired of that, and what they have done is to deploy and, you know, mass men in black t-shirts, with huge sticks, to literally beat people on the streets. Uh, sound like a gun, right? That's exactly what the state has done. In full view of cameras, under the command of the police, mass you know, armed men with sticks are beating up civilians on the streets for nothing else but just showing up on the streets and waving a V sign. This is the sign of the people. Uh, and there are no investigations, no arrests, no prosecutions. Now, you have to understand the role of black men in black t shirts in Uganda in the past. They have raided the high court in the past and uh, abducted suspects from the judges' chambers when the judges hear the case. They have held demonstrations against judges for giving decisions against the state. So, so these black men are very notorious in our country. In the past, they were called black members because the ones that uh, stormed the courthouse were called black members. So they see us concerns about uh, the dignity and assault of people and being able to demonstrate freely uh, in Uganda. The the third thing is really about the increasing intolerance towards civil society. Because prior to the election, civil society held a countrywide uh, um, mobilization, really asking Ugandans what sort of reforms they wanted to see before the election. That ended up in what was called the Citizens Compact, which was a set of reforms that was agreed by the vast majority of people in Uganda. And they put these demands to the state and asked the state to amend the electoral laws sure free and fair election. The state ignored that, but the state accused civil society organizations for having a political agenda uh, in the country. And that has seen an increasing tolerance towards civil society organizations, particularly those who are working around the areas of governance and human rights. I mean, if you are distributing food and living in you have no problem with it. Because you are essentially uh, subsidizing the state efficiency. But the ones that are asking for accountability with respect to human rights are first increasing uh, intimidation by the government officials. Recently, a new law was passed called the NGO Act, Non Governmental Organizations Act. Uh, the law is simply really a permit regime uh, so that anybody who wants to go and do uh, work for charity has to get one permission from the state to do so, even if they're registered. And the condition for grant of that permission has been very, very stringent. Namely, the fact that you must have what they call a memorandum of understanding with local communities and local district officials. Now, that's nearly impossible. Take, for example, if you're a national organization, how many communities are you going to get MOUs from? They also can deny you uh, a permit on allegations of what they call working against the dignity of the people of Uganda. Very broad terms. But, uh, it's, it's unknown what it is uh, meant by what we get into. For example, we would be using a picture of a starving child uh, to ask for food aid amounts to act against the dignity of people of Uganda. It's, it's your guess as good as mine. But, but that is also viewed as really a provision that's targeting uh, minority groups, particularly those working with sex workers and sexual minorities, the LGBTI community. Because for a very long time, there have been attempts to restrict their activities in Uganda. The LGBTI organizations cannot register legally as legal entities in Uganda. And uh, with this law, uh, even their informal ways of organization will become criminal because to organize around such things, you must register and get a permit. Uh, so this law, and in particular this provision, uh, on against the link to people it is meant to target such groups that are very unpopular in Uganda. The fourth thing again is just about uh, sexual minority. Maria told you about the anti-gay law which was declared by the country's constitutional court in 2014. Even though that was a good case, in my view, it didn't resolve a bigger problem, which is the question of the attitudes of all the Ugandans towards sexual minorities, towards sex workers, uh, 
uh, another minority groups. Because up until now, such minorities face intense discrimination in access to social services. It's difficult for them to go to a hospital to get treatment without being targeted. Uh, you know, just before I came here, four days ago, a gay man was beaten on the street by a mob and had his jaws dislocated. Um, he tried to fix back his jaws. Uh, many people are being expelled by their families uh, because they seem to have a different sexual orientation. There's widespread uh, uh, disapproval of uh, LGBT communities in the land. There's a 1950 legislation that still remains on our own that is being used to prosecute uh, people on the basis of their sexual orientation. That law is really a law left by the British in 1950, which essentially outlawed what is called having cannibal against other nature. I have no idea what that is. What is having cannibal against the nature, the world of nature. But that is being used to, to, to prosecute uh, gay people in Uganda. And for the very first time in our, in our country's history, last year there were two uh, convictions under that law. And these people face a very rough time in Uganda. Uh, we do provide them legal services. Just a drop in the ocean in terms of what is required. The last one that I want to speak about really is what I see as a pattern now uh, the attack on women, uh, the particular onslaught on women involved in activism. Now, it sounds, it sounds you know, perhaps it's random, but ladies who are taking part in electoral politics are increasingly becoming a target by the police force to physical abuse, to abuse of their integrity. Uh, many people uh, have been undressed in public. And people tend to have more outrage if you undress a woman in public than when you do a man. Uh, they don't do undress men anyway. <coughs> they target women so that they discourage women from taking part in active electoral politics by doing things like undressing them in public, uh, you know, squeezing hard their breasts, uh, touching their private parts, and really handling the position of women in a way that is. is very degrading. This appears to be a pattern that is, is now emerging. And then lastly, I just want to give some time for questions, is, is the onslaught of the media. Because in Uganda, the most popular means of information sharing, uh, besides social media, are FM stations that are all over the country. If you want to get to the population, you just go to a local language FM station and people just listen. Uh, we find a village woman in a very small village market with a small venue listening. And whatever they listen to radio is gospel truth. So there's a, a move to restrict use and access to the media uh, for people who are seen to be uh, critical of government or who are dissenters. Uh, media owners being put under immense pressure not to post people for all different views. Uh, radio uh, talk show hosts appear in many shows in Uganda are increasingly becoming uh, resentful of posting people who are seen as uh, critical of the state. And just to conclude on the LGBTI issue, uh, again, on the weekend before I came, the Speaker of the National Assembly, she's involved in a very fierce campaign to retain her seat as Speaker. He had a weekend talk show, a very popular one called the Capital Gun, uh, and promised that uh, when she's elected Speaker, now, the speaker has done that before, but really the point that I wanted to make is that sexual minorities are used as a political scapegoat for people in Uganda who want election because they know that it is very popular uh, with many people across the country. So they evoke that as a sense of sympathy to win elections. Uh, and they, this speaker of the National Assembly has been some kind of a queen of doing that. Uh, and then she's, she's again uh, bringing up this kind of discussion because she's come back to the election in uh, May uh, when she's uh, time as a speaker expires. But I'll leave the rest for questions. There's so much I can talk about, uh, about youth and the role of the youth in Uganda. You know, Uganda is 75% of this population, although they are 25, so they have their own set of challenges. Uh, but I'll leave it for Q&A. Thank you for listening to me. And if people remember to speak up tonight. Hi, I'm Suzanne Newton and I've worked 
Dean Gabriel last year and Tom Powell and Peter Wetherman. Um, and I wanted to say, Nicholas, I'm going to thank you very much for your talk. Um, what I didn't really understand before I went to Uganda was that having a benevolent dictator like Ms. Ebony can be better than other situations in Africa. Like, I kind of thought it was democracy or nothing. But I'd like to know from Nicholas, um, how do you think you find the kind of tools for real tools? My name is Davis. Uh, I've got a question for you in regards to the role of uh, the courts in oppression. A couple of times uh, the cases in court that appear to have gone the wrong way, and uh, based on the previous court rulings on the elections, court made some recommendations in terms of, of the victim. How come they have never followed them up? I would think to that serve the democracy to follow them up the government. Thank you. Uh, my name is Innocent. My question is uh, in relation to Uganda and the rest of East Africa. Last year there was a coup in Burundi where more than 250,000 Burundian people fled the country to Rwanda. And since the coup, Diplomatic relations between Rwanda and the Burundi is going so it's going down at the moment. My question is about African Union. Why African Union appointed Mr. Museveni to become the mediator of the political conflict Burundi while he's seeking himself more than the second the third term? Why the media paid more attention on the Burundian issues when Uganda, Rwanda have been presidents have been ruling the country more than two decades or three? There's no political attention on international basis. Finally, it's uh, when I was working last year, I went overseas during the year for the United Nations for an intern and. Uh, was involved in the section of empowering refugees. My question about because Kenya is about 2007 violence when there was when there was uh, an election where the opposition contested the election, saying that he won the election similar to Uganda. What is happening at the moment? Now, the International Criminal Court took the matter, and the both president and First president, the case has been acquitted. My question about Kenya is Is the Human Rights Watch or international community paying attention on witnesses who gave evidence in the Hague? If you know, why they were involved? Because in Africa, as much as I'm concerned, who has the money is the one who has the power. It's not about what happened, it's about the poor to protect the rich. Is the human rights watch in Africa, in general, in particular, Burundi, Rwanda, Kenya and Uganda aware? Because I've read your experiences. In 2005, when President of Burundi was appointed, it was similar. Thank you. Well, thank you for your great questions. Uh, I think the hard work is rare. Let me start with Susan. He, he said that uh, Uganda is a wrong how can you kind of be assisted to move forward towards the full effect democracy? I think first we want to underscore that Uganda has come a long way. Uh, from the dictatorial and murderous regime of the Yabin uh, to the difficult regime of Milton Porter, 
So Uganda has made some progress. Uh, and, 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 and I think that in measuring Uganda's democratic uh, credentials, we go to America uh, as, as, as a starting point. But it's also true that Uganda still far, I mean, falls far short of being a fully fledged democracy. That is inclusive, that is, uh, that is progressive democracy, respect for rule of law, where everybody is going to be with us, that's a part. Uh, how can Uganda be assisted to, to, to become a fully fledged democracy? I think that first and foremost, you've got to underscore the point that it is Ugandans who must take the first responsibility to make their country a democratic country. It is not going to be given to us as a foreign power. Um, even if they assist us, it is not their primary responsibility. So the duty of making Uganda a democratic state lies with Ugandans. And therefore, civic awareness in Uganda then becomes a very important point to underscore that the ordinary people in Uganda need to appreciate, for example, that the breakdown in roads and services across the country, it's not just because of corruption, not just because of the theft to central government, but because of the governance problem. And each time I speak to people in my village, which is, which is very far from Kampala, is that I don't seem to tell them you have the right to demonstrate. I think we have an obligation to connect human rights in the abstract to the daily lives of Ugandans. I probably have frustrations. 16 women die every day giving birth across the country. We've got to make a connection between that and governance and begin to ask people to demand accountability of their leaders. Because even if a leader has control of all the power, all the guns, all the money, I think that people collectively are still more powerful. I use the analogy of the bicycle tire. People in government are like bicycle tires. They respond to pressure. They keep pumping them. So we've got to incite Uganda to keep pumping <coughs> that tire until it responds to pressure. And only Ugandans can do that. But the international community has a role as well. Because Uganda depends on aid. Life depends on aid. Um, a lot of our development budgets are still funded by loans from one bank, grants, and donations from other countries. So those countries have a responsibility to see that their investment is made in a more democratic state. And I think that they have uh, not just a moral but a legal responsibility to ensure that Uganda and the Ugandan state invests in its people and respects fundamental rights and freedoms. So I think that uh, Australia, as I speak right now, the Australian Special Envoy for Human Rights, the Honorable Philip Rudolph, is in Kampala uh, to listen to people in Uganda. I hope that beyond just listening, uh, they can take a proactive step to ensure that Uganda, as a member of the international community, is made to conform to the smart standards that we all aspire for. Uh, let me talk about the courts. I practice law in Uganda, and, and I understand the frustration of Ugandans in the court system. The judiciary in Uganda is going through a makeover because the old conservative and, pro and sometimes progressive judges have either died or retired. And, and so it's being replenished at all levels really. at the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, the High Court. So the courts are getting new judges. The general feeling in Uganda is that the judges who are being appointed are what we call cadre judges. These are people who have either lost elections, failed politicians, they might qualify as lawyers and judges, but in fact their primary preoccupation is not critical thinking about how to apply the law applying politics to the law. Uh, the Supreme Court now has uh, nearly half of its members are former government ministers uh, who lost elections, uh, who are seen as appointed to the bench uh, to keep them comfortable. You know? uh, so there's a serious doubt about the independence of the courts in Uganda. And uh, indeed, as you say, David, in the last two presidential elections, the court made serious recommendations. It wasn't a court judgment. In law, we said there were decisions of the time. Those were decisions made as by the way recommendations. But a decision, a recommendation from the Supreme Court in any country should be taken seriously. Uh, but in Uganda, uh, that's not the case. All of the court's recommendations in the past two presidential elections are the Supreme Court, but no other state. In fact, this time, the Supreme Court again made the same recommendations in their decision. 
the court is viewed as a lamenting court, so the court is also lamenting like any other ordinary judge. The judge is the same. <coughs> we turn our judges into lamenting justices of the Supreme Court. Judges don't lament, they issue orders. But the court has felt, I mean, has felt shy of issuing binding orders on the state. Uh, there's a lack of judicial activism. Uh, for example, in this last Supreme Court hearing, I led the team by civil society organizations who applied to be admitted by the court as friends of the court, or the court amicus before the court. The court rejected our application for amicus. Uh, but in doing so, uh, the court was seized with the argument that we were going to make that that court has a duty to give government even timelines to say, we have made these recommendations, please come back to us in six months and update us on the progress. The court they are very shy of doing that, and as such, we have those recommendations that are still pending. Because all election observation reports uh, since 2001, whether local or international, recommended reforms that the electoral system is best they will be in the world. Innocent, I'll leave a large part of your question to Maria because she works in Jambora and she has a better knowledge of Jambora than I do. Uh, but, but just to, to answer that, uh, two things. First, President Museveni, as I said, is the only surviving signatory to the East African Treaty. So he's seen as a regional statesman. But also historically, President Museveni played a key role with Thabo Mbeki of, of South Africa in the Arusha Accord that brought peace to Burundi. So he was a natural <coughs> choice, but a choice that is heavily uh, controversial. It's a divisive figure because the very basis for the conflict in Burundi now is the president's attempt to remain in office for a third term, even when his time in office has expired. The champion of third term in South Africa is President He was the first leader to amend this country's constitution in 2005 to allow him to contest uh, for a third term. So people view him as somebody who is not objective. Uh, and perhaps that's why the negotiations in the peace process in Burundi has not made much progress. Uh, but he's a natural choice, he's divisive. Uh, he has inspired the government in the third term, he inspired the guy in Kujimbura to the third term, and he's now inspiring the DRC leader to the third term as well. So he's a very divisive, divisive partner. I would, my own view would be he's not the right person to have a proper mediation role uh, in Burundi. And perhaps the African Union should have looked further afield for uh, better negotiations. Uh, it seems we are doing so just to get money because the European Union promised us 3 million euros for that process. It makes us some money as well. Uh, on the ICC, again, Maria has a place to answer that, so Maria has a place to answer that. <laughs> Um, on Burundi, I'll say, um, having lived there for several years, it's obviously been a tragic and terrible <coughs> past year with the number of extrajudicial killings that have been going on. Um, you know, I, I agree with Nicholas that, you know, because of the history of Uganda's role in the Arusha Accord, there was a sort of natural sense that they should go back and look for President Museveni to be involved, though clearly the dynamics had changed given that this was uh, about the third term. Um, I also think very quickly last year it became apparent that both President Museveni and Honorable Kiyonga, the Minister of Defense, who was supposed to be the man on the scene for the talks, were both involved in their own uh, campaigns for re-election and didn't really play the kind of assertive role, and active role, that I think the AU and, and some Western powers wanted them to play. Um, Honorable Kiyonga lost his election and President Museveni won his, and I think at this point there is hope that um, the Tanzanians will play the role that the Ugandans were supposed to play. So I, I get the sense anyway from the Americans and the British that there has been an acceptance that the Ugandans are, that the Ugandan government is not going to play the key role for any So we'll see where those talks go and if there is progress now that Maka and others are going to play a, a, their part. 
when it comes to Kenya and the ICC, obviously it's been uh, tragic. Human Rights Watch did a lot of work on documenting abuses during the post-electoral period. We actually just this year issued a report looking at the legacy of uh, SGBP and the crimes of mostly rape committed in that post-electoral period in late 2007 and early 2008 to look at the lack of accountability and even the, just the lack of social services and health and psychosocial support available to survivors of sexual violence from that period of time to push the government not just on accountability but also on reparations because there's been some discussion of, of access to reparations for certain groups, um, although there's not really much of a plan in place so far. On the question of witness tampering in the ICC, I think generally we would agree with you that obviously justice is very complicated and we've had a lot of long-standing concerns about the way in which uh, witnesses were treated in, in the whole process. Um, you know, we, we have put out things to complain about that interference um, and obviously the Thanksgiving service that took place over the weekend in Kenya was you know, certainly it felt to us very, very troubling given the large number of victims who have had no, no justice in Kenya. So we continue to push for those for, for some kind of accountability mechanism and certainly hope that next year you got, as Kenya's elections will, uh, you know, be able to take place without that kind of return to violence. But I, I think there's no doubt that, that Kenya still has a long way to go to recover from what occurred and accountability may well slip through. Unfortunately, Human Rights Watch will continue to talk about it. Obviously, many Kenyan groups will continue to talk about it. But whether we'll see traction, you know, I think it's very hard to say. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I mean, the role of the AU in the whole region is a very complicated question. And I think, you know, we continue to push the AU to improve its human rights mechanisms. But it's, it's a challenge. Um, I mean, the only sort of example we have where there's been a bit of progress was on this issue of we, we put out a whole report looking at sexual exploitation and abuse of women in Somalia by AU uh, soldiers, both mostly Ugandans but also Burundians. Um, and in that case, the AU actually did agree to carry out their own investigation. They put out a set of recommendations. It's the first time that we've seen them do that on the human rights issue. Um, so I think that was progress. At the same time, those recommendations haven't really been taken up yet. And uh, we don't see the conduct and discipline unit of the African Union really being fully staffed and manned with the capacity to carry out much in the way of investigations when it comes to AU troops. Um, that burden still ends up with the troop contributing countries themselves. And as we see there, accountability is really quite sporadic and not in a way in which Somali civilians can participate um, and mostly doesn't occur at all. So the AU has a long way to go when it comes to sort of pushing for human rights protections among troop contributing countries around the region. Intimidated and repressed. 
I'm wondering you yourself whether you've faced any of these kind of situations. If I can ask that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, hi Nicholas, my name is Amani. Um, so I know that you've made, um, you mentioned about women and um, and the corrupt, some members of corrupt government using um, harassment and sexual exploitation to disengage women in um, politically um, engaging in politics. Um, so my question is that, and I know that um, Maria, you mentioned before that the AU is working really hard in terms of recommendation and reforms and ensuring that um, women's rights are protected and they're not oppressed. Um, so in terms of human rights um, perspective, like what do you guys impose, um, come say five years time, how do you then get the same women that were oppressed and sexually harassed during um, the politics to then getting the momentum of voting again and um, just voicing their opinion? Because I know that, you know, in some, um, African countries, women are very marginalized and they're not very politically active. So how, what does the Ugandan um, government, what, what will they employ? I mean, these are people that have been tormented and for them to come out of their shell again is going to be problematic. Public prosecutions has indicted him, has directed the police to arrest him, so that is formally charged for a court of law. Unfortunately, those directives have been ignored. The same policeman is being deployed on the streets to Kampala every day to beat up people who are protesting. So the case is quite familiar. It's very frustrating, but it's an example of an ongoing trend of powerful people who are in the service of the state who can do anything get away with it. The government spokesperson, uh, name is Ufondo Pondo, uh, one time shot in broad daylight uh, somebody who would be accused to have smashed the back of a woman. Uh, and still the government spokesperson, no charges against him. Uh, recently, uh, armed soldiers uh, shot dead in full view of the camera, uh, a man in Western Uganda who was just charging at them with a stick. The guy with the stick could have been foolish, but the punishment for somebody who is stupid and foolish is not execution. The common trend is that <coughs> all of these cases go uninvestigated, you know, go unpunished. It's, it's impunity. Um, what can we do uh, to ensure that these people are going to book? In so many cases, we have never forgotten about their crimes. We take every opportunity to remind people that these are suspected criminals who should be in a court of law. So we do that really consistently in Uganda, on radio, on TV, on social media, everywhere we can. But in cases where we have the resources, take public investigation against them. There are so many of those cases, and there are just too few lawyers to have the courage and the interest to do these kind of cases. But in cases where we have an actual complainant, who is willing to come forward and take the risk and the evidence, we have taken public interest <coughs> to make sure that this kind of people are going to go. Um, about land grabbing, I come from Northern Uganda. Uh, Northern Uganda is a very complicated part of the country because in the 20 years of the war between the LRA and government of Uganda, the entire population was forced into, into camps. As a result, their land was left idle people who had access to the state resources took land, took property and claimed as their own. Now, when the war ended, people went back from camps to their villages, only returned in many cases to find more powerful people claiming ownership of their ancestral land. Now, that has caused a big land problem, coupled with the land tenure system in northern Uganda, which is purely communal. Uh, people don't own titles, land is owned communal either for grazing, for farming, the value ground. Uh, so there is a serious land conflict uh, in Uganda. But 
But beyond that, in Uganda, you have resource-based conflicts across the country, areas where you discover the natural resources, say oil. Uh, the communities there are being deprived of access to land. So land is becoming a very, very, very contentious issue in Uganda. Um, if you go to court, you find many cases of assault, battery, uh, hacking somebody with a manga. The cases might appear to you like an assault case, but in fact, underlying reason for all those cases is a land conflict between families, between, between communities. So there's a serious land problem in Uganda. Now, there, there might be several things that can be done to ensure that we uh, address the conflict. Uh, but I think in my view, a couple of things are hard to be done. First is the reform of the land uh, laws. Because you have multiple overlapping claims over land. You might have a land title in your hand, but somebody who has lived on your land for 15 years has a legal right called, um, called, a, it's called a bona fide occupant or called a lawful occupant. And you can do nothing about that person. You can't evict them, you must pay them to live your own property. So we need to reflect on reforming the land tenure system in Uganda uh, to address some of these structural and legal problems. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your name. I used to ask a personal question whether I do not face threats. I do face threats. But I think they are just threats. Okay? Somebody who is serious who wants to fight, they come and face you and come and fight. Now, I face a lot of threats because of many of the kind of cases we take. They are very unpopular cases. I think the most difficult for me has been the, the 2014 challenge to Uganda's anti gay law. At the time I was serving as the Secretary General of the National Bar Association, I was a fairly powerful person within the law society. And um, you would imagine that lawyers are sophisticated. But why are you forgiven? Because lawyers within the law society mobilized to kick me out as the Secretary General of the law society. Primarily because they, think they, they thought that my challenge of the law was against what I'm called, my values of the law society. So we do face a lot of threats because of the kind of cases we take. I've got any death threats on phone. Uh, my Facebook page is good bouncing ground for lots of insults. <laughs> Some people are really so dedicated. There's this one lady who, for the last five years, every week sends me two emails. <laughs> I like her tenacity. It's called the dinner I'm sorry. And our emails are nothing but just pages and pages of insults. No coherent sentence. <laughs> So she sends me pages and pages of words such as stupid, brain dead, brain dead, uh, agent of foreign powers, so do my set out. And that's like 10 paragraphs of those words. <laughs> this can't make sense of them. Just insult. She's, she's dedicated. So we face those kind of threats. But as I said, the threats that I face are nowhere near the threats people that I serve face every day. Because I'm a fairly you know, popular guy in town, so I have many friends in high places. And I tell people that if you touch me, Maria will come up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Maria is a uh, fear in <laughs> so, so I have friends in high places that you know, the cost of doing something to me is really very high. And uh, so I, I survive, I'm fine. Um, I'll leave the one of women to Maria. Again, because, not because you're dating, because it's a difficult question. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, look, most countries have a long way to go when it comes to ensuring that women's rights are fully protected and that women uh, of all socioeconomic levels can freely participate in politics. So um, there's, as I said, a long way to go. Um, the AU has, you know, as I said, has made some steps to looking at this issue of sexual exploitation and abuse, but there is a long process ahead for it to really be leading the pack. The UN has the problems of these allegations of sexual exploitation and abuse going on in Central African Republic. So the UN is no model for the African Union, if anything, it's a model of what not to do in the face of these kinds of situations. Um, 
And uh, we certainly hope that the African Union would decide to actually lead the way and set up good models for accountability for, for sexual and gender-based crimes in uh, conflict settings. I have to say, I think Uganda as a country has many very strong women leaders um, who have stood up to a lot of intimidation, repression, scrutiny. I mean, the, not only the woman who has been the Speaker of Parliament, who I don't always agree with, uh, but she's been a strong political leader. Uh, Uganda has dedicated female parliamentarians who are supposed to be there to speak up for women's rights. Some of the opposition women leaders are uh, certainly assertive and aggressive and have taken quite a beating. Um, you know, I don't see women in Uganda, younger women in Uganda, pulling away from political life. If anything, the actions of the police in targeting women over the last year, uh, my senses at least have emboldened a lot of younger women to step up and be more aggressive about demanding their rights. So we'll see where it goes, obviously, and it's certainly possible that we'll see some women choosing to self-censor. You know, we have those concerns, certainly, about the media that as journalists are attacked in broad daylight, as we've seen journalists be arrested, that, you know, we are concerned that we see self-censorship among the journalists as far as choosing the stories that they decide to cover. That could certainly happen among younger women uh, who, you know, may not decide to participate in political life. But thus far, that's not what I've seen. I mean, it would be interesting to hear from the Ugandans what they believe, but my sense is that there have been some very aggressive and, um, and assertive female politicians in Uganda. Whether one will ever hold presidency, we'll see. You know, many countries have a long way to go, including my own. Thank you. The next event we've got scheduled is on the 22nd of May, um, an evening with Edward Snowden. Bye, window. <laughs> uh, Marius, where is that? Uh, at the Melbourne Convention and Entertainment Centre down at... at the Melbourne, yeah. It's in conjunction with Penny Inc. And so that is a paid event, it's not a free event, but that's on the 22nd of May. And then we have our annual conference on the 22nd of July, and uh, we've started to unveil again. Mr. Um, Speakers, if you look at our website, we can see our emails. Um, I should also mention that yesterday we launched our annual appeal. Uh, we, um, our aim is once again to use um, our academic expertise and our um, reputation to improve human rights protection and to support the human rights leaders of tomorrow and also to educate the public. And so tonight's event is part of that program of public education. And we have for many years um, uh, been you know, delighted to provide most of these events for free, um, apart from the two that I just mentioned, <laughs> um, um, such as the one tonight. And so, uh, we're very grateful to um, our current donors, and if you would uh, feel like joining them, um, there is a donation box outside, is that right, Janice? Yes. And also there's a form on each of the seats. Um, look, thank you all for coming tonight, and I also have to thank Human Rights Watch for bringing, um, for bringing our speakers and for offering the Caston Centre the opportunity to co-host. And will you please also join me in thanking Maria Burnett and Nicholas Theo for their excellent speeches.